Ladies and gentlemen, order, order, order in the house. Good morning. How are we doing? Wonderful to see you all here bright and early as we focus on empowering women, transforming Africa. This is the Africa State of the Region session. We are live streaming, we are live blogging, we are live tweeting as well in French and in English. And you can follow the conversations, hashtag Africa S. O -R. So please do so and get many more people in this room with us as we highlight the critical role of women empowerment, their economic empowerment in moving Africa forward. And we ask, how can we level the playing field? My name is Julie Gishuru. I am a passionate Afro-optimist. Where are the Afro-optimists in the room? Yes. Many of us, I'm so pleased. And I'm an African woman. And allow me to set some context as we start these discussions. African women are unleashing their own potential every single day in the toughest of circumstances. In fragile situations, they're looking after their families, holding it together, feeding them. In better situations, they're getting better education for their children. They're building their communities. They're planning their homes. They're planning their societies. I think the question we ask is, how do we leverage and unleash our potential to truly rise and help them move from survival to prosperity? Does that make sense? We have an incredible panel today, but I'm very excited for us all to be kicked off in this discussion today by Vice President of the World Bank for Africa. Let's give a warm round of applause to Hafez Khanem as he comes up to share his thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I don't understand what she said about being bright and early. This is not bright and early. <laughs> uh, well, welcome all. Thank you for being here. Uh, it is good to see a lot of uh, friendly faces around the room and uh, honorable ministers and friends and colleagues. Uh, I would like to start uh, by telling you, uh, by making a confession, that in my old age I've become a feminist. <laughs> And I have to tell you, I'm not a feminist because uh, it feels good or because I really wanted a round of applause. Uh, <laughs> and it's not, I'm not a feminist because of my wife or my mother or my daughter. Uh, but I actually am a feminist because of hard-nosed economics. And this is what I'll be talking to you about today. Uh, it is simply uh, unthinkable that half of the population would be denied opportunities to participate because of their gender. Uh, it holds us all back. And it is particularly a problem in Africa. Uh, Africa is actually the only region in the world where women are more likely to be entrepreneurs than men. Uh, but those women also earn only uh, one third less than what a man earns. Uh, the 40% of agricultural labor in Africa is women. But the yields from farms run by women are also one third less than the yields from farms run by men. Now, this is not because uh, uh, women are particularly bad at being entrepreneurs or at being farmers. It is because women do not, are not given the same uh, uh, tools. Uh, uh, as men. They don't have the same access to resources, to capital. They don't have the same access to education and skills. And so this gender gap costs Africa a lot. In Ethiopia, the annual cost of inequality in agricultural productivity and entrepreneurship combined was estimated by, uh, uh, by our colleagues at $2.2 billion. 
2.2 billion dollars. That's 3.3 percent of Ethiopia's GDP. In Niger, and I see uh, the minister from Niger here, uh, the e economic cost of gender inequality is billions of dollars. Closing these gaps could reduce poverty. Our estimates show that closing the agricultural gap in Malawi, for example, would lift 238,000 people out of poverty. Gender inequality starts early and impacts people throughout their lifetimes. And like any entrenched development challenge, the causes and solutions are many. Let me take you through just a few of the most pressing challenges and some of the promising solutions and approaches that we are seeing. Child marriage. <laughs> Nearly f four in ten young women in Africa are married before the age of 18. This means that we are robbing those girls of their childhood. But seriously also, this means that those, uh, uh, that those girls, children themselves, are starting to have children. And the result is that we have high child mortality, we have high maternal mortality, and we have very high stunting rates because those girls, they don't know how to, uh, uh, how to feed their children, how to raise their children. So if you want to improve the human capital index in Africa, you have to end child marriage. We have to keep the girls at school rather than get marrying them off when they're si still children. Uh, when a girl hits adolescence, uh, child marriage is compounded by early fertility and the transition from school to work. Our approach to empowering girls needs to tackle all of these at once and help girls make their transition into adulthood with the information, support, and skills they need. Studies across Africa have demonstrated the potential of adolescent girls' empowerment programs to change the life trajectories of young women. These programs typically combine community-based girls' clubs, life skills training, vocational training, and sometimes financial literacy and microcredit access for young women. In Uganda, a program for young women aged 12 to 25 increased the likelihood that girls engaged in income-generating activities by 72%. The program also in, in, induced a stark drop in adolescent fertility, early entry into marriage or cohabitation, and the share of girls reporting having had sex against their will. Those programs have also helped buffer young women from conflict in South Sudan and the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, indicating that they can be prioritized in fragile settings. The results from Uganda have been embedded in the design of a, a, a project that I particularly uh, like, is the Sahel Women's Empowerment and Demographic Dividend Project. The program includes clubs for girls and for boys, which offer safe spaces for reflecting on norms related to education, marriage, and childbearing. Uh, girls and boys attend primary school at around the same uh, rate in most countries in Africa. The issue is that the older they are, the more likely they are for the girls to leave school, to drop out. The number of adolescent girls out of school in Africa is higher than anywhere else in the world. This leads to a wider gap between the skills and education that men have versus those that women have. As adults, this formal education gap is compounded by other skills gaps. For entrepreneurs, this includes key business skills. In Togo, we piloted a new kind of training called personal initiative training. This training focused on developing things like proactivity, persistence, extroversion, which everyone in this room knows are critical skills for business. This training was about changing 
the entrepreneur's mindset. And in a randomized control trial, it beat standard business training by a mile, getting female entrepreneurs 40% higher profits, sustained over two and a half years versus no significant impact from the standard training. So, you know, the female entrepreneurs were 30% less, making 30% less uh, income than men. With this training, they were making 10% more than men because they gained 40%. So this just sh sh gives you uh, one example. Women also, so it's not just uh, in terms of skills, uh, but women also have less capital and land than men. These are the resources that matter most for households in Africa. A few things can help women even th uh, things up. For example, combining mobile savings and credit with business training or educating families on the benefits of, uh, of joint land titling. One of the promising tools I see is, is psychometric testing, which assesses the likelihood that someone will repay a loan. Banks use, can use this to give low or no collateral laws. We have tested this as part of the Women Entrepreneurship Development Project in Ethiopia. Customers who scored at a high threshold of the test were seven times more likely to repay their loans compared to lower performing customers. This is now being scaled up in Zimbabwe and Madagascar, with more to follow in Nigeria, Zambia, and Cote d'Ivoire. The maternal mortality rate in sub-Saharan Africa is two and a half times the average of the world. This is often due to basic health centers that are simply not equipped to deal with complications before, during, and after childbirth. Ideally, we would have well-functioning medical centers attended by well-trained doctors and nurses in every corner of every country in Africa. But we all know that this is not the case today, so we need to work on two fronts. For the long term, we need to invest in the ideal system of improving hospital facilities, making sure people in remote areas have reliable roads and transportation options to get there, and training skilled health workers at the community level in case something is too urgent to make the journey all the way to the nearest hospital. But in the immediate uh, term, right now, this is actually a matter of life and death, and we cannot let perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, in, in many of our projects, like SWEAT, for example, we help train midwives at the community level. Uh, so far, over 6,600 over 6, across, the, the, uh, uh, across the Sahel, which makes a real difference for uh, expected mothers. Physical, emotional, and sexual and economic violence is another real concern for women, and is present in every country. The impact and costs of gender-based violence on human potential, health, and well-being can stop progress in its tracks. For example, two-thirds of young female ap ap apprentices in Ibadan, Nigeria, which is uh, uh, reported having experienced physical violence. We are working on this across the continent, including through a project in DRC. This project aims to reach 800,000 beneficiaries over the course of four years. It focuses on several fronts, violence prevention and response, boosting the capacity of the health system while also reporting, supporting specialized uh, services that can give extra help in the most complex cases, and training doctors and providers in even the most remote areas. And actually, uh, I was talking in the, uh, to Dr. McWiggy, the Nobel Prize winner in, in DRC, and uh, we are uh, uh, partnering with him, but not just for uh, programs uh, in, in, in Congo, but also across the continent. And he wants to start also with work in the Central African Republic. Uh, now, let me conclude. I have out outlined many challenges, but and also some of the solutions. Uh, but 
I, I would like also to conclude on a, on a positive note. You know, the, we see change all across Africa today. Empowered girls and women are our future in Africa. And everywhere I travel now, I meet women who are doing incredible things. So, I, uh, for example, I was, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know which, I wanted to give you an example, but there's too many in my mind right now. Well, one of, uh, one of the most uh, incredible women uh, I met was a, is a lady from Gambia, who actually I met in New York uh, last month. And she came and she was talk to, uh, talking to me. Uh, she wanted to talk to me about ev everything that she was doing uh, uh, to stop uh, uh, female genital mutilation. And this, this was a younger, she was younger than my daughter. She was maybe 25, 26 years old. And she has been crisscrossing the continent, talking about FGM and how to stop uh, uh, FGM. I was really uh, impressed uh, when, I, when I talked to her. But th th this young women who push for changing social norms across the continent, this is the future. Uh, and really, and, uh, uh, I thought that uh, uh, th that uh, I was really very, very uh, impressed. But I have lots of other examples to tell you. But uh, I see that I don't want to uh, run out of time. But but uh, I, I thought this uh, this was especially important because. Uh, uh, in addition to all of the things that I said about uh, giving women skills, capital, land, uh, uh, and so on, we also need to change mindsets and social norms. And it is, it is those, and it is only the, the women, uh, especially the youth, who, who, will, uh, who will bring this uh, uh, about. So, but we have also, other than those young people I am telling you about, I mean, we have many other good examples in the continent. Last year, uh, Ethiopia's parliament elected uh, a woman president for the, for the first time. Uh, so uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and South Africa uh, uh, ha have reached gender parity in their cabinets and have appointed women to key ministerial posts. I look around the room and I see uh, many women uh, leaders uh, uh, from Niger, from Mali, from Uganda. So, uh, uh, so, so things are changing uh, in the continent, and it's really up to all of us, men and women, to do our utmost to ensure an equal future for Africa's girls, boys, men, and women. And we have to do that, not just because it is the right thing to do, we have to do that because it is the only way we can develop Africa and end poverty in the continent. Thank you very much. Hafez, thank you so much. Hafez tells us he is a feminist because of hard-nosed economics. It is the right thing to do, but also it makes economic sense. Thank you so much for taking us through um, the challenges that we are facing and also giving us practical examples of what is working, the solutions. Let's now welcome to come up and join us Chief Economist Albert Zufak, who will share with us um, much more on uh, the data, what it's telling us. Uh, let's give him a round of applause as he comes up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Good morning, Julie. Thank you. Good morning. So let's jump straight into the numbers. Um, what is the current state of play in terms of uh, Africa's economy? Where are we? Julie, let me first say that we've just launched the 20th edition of the Africa's Pulse. That's our 10th anniversary edition. And I would want us to acknowledge that because not many publications have that you know, timeline. And, and that's, that's really good. We're building institutions there as well. Now, from the Africa's Pulse, what do we find? How's the state of the African economy? Well, the state of 
the African economy is a matter of concern, Julie. We've just projected that for 2019, Sub-Saharan Africa will grow only at 2.6%. That's not good enough. And in fact, for the fourth consecutive year, Sub-Saharan Africa is growing just at a rate really close to population growth. We're not even catching up with population wow. growth. That's clearly not good enough. And what is also important to highlight, Julie, is that um, we're not alone in this situation. Mm -hmm. In fact, global trade tensions are actually affecting the world economy, depressing investment and uh, industrial production, and that's affecting Africa as well, and affecting other regions even more. Mm -hmm. In fact, Africa is probably even more resilient than the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news, however, Julie, is that beyond the average, number of African countries are still doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, Africa is still home to four of the fastest growing economies in the world. Countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana are all growing above 7%. And six other economies are growing above 6%. So 10 African economies are growing above 6% are among the fastest growing in the world. Wow. Julie. Wow. That's amazing, and I'm going to come to you know what's holding us back and what we need to do. But you know, just before I do that, we sat here six months ago right. in April. The numbers really are not shifting the way we need them to shift. So you know, what's different over the last six months, and, and then we move forward to the question of uh, what's holding Africa back and yeah. how do we move forward? Julie, that's a, a fantastic question. What's new? We were all here in April. And the message was probably not that different. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you three things that are new. And in fact, the main thing that is new is that since April, we have become less optimistic about the situation for 2019. And let me give you three reasons why. Mm -hmm. The first is that since April, trade tensions, global trade tensions, and other global uncertainties have worsened. And they are affecting Africans' export. And if you take China, for example, mm -hmm. one of our main trading partners in Africa, they have experienced the lowest growth in years, which means basically that they are lowering the imports of our commodities. So worsening trade tensions, mm -hmm. global tensions, have actually affected African economies. Second, we have had terrible climate shocks. The cyclone that hit Mozambique, uh, you know, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Moz you know, Mozambique, all these countries have suffered the impact of severe cl climate shocks. That cyclones in the eastern part. Mm -hmm. But on the western part, we're also seeing rising sea levels that are in, you know, inducing coastal erosion mm -hmm. and therefore threatening economic activities in our cities. Right. But more importantly, there is another third, there's a third dimension in the climate shocks, which is the alternance of drought yeah. and floods that are affecting agricultural output. Countries like Kenya have seen their agricultural output decline. Yeah. So that's clearly uh, you know, a, a very, very important one. And um, look, what is also new since April mm -hmm. is that we are now seeing a uh, decline in investment. Decline in investment fueled by deteriorating investment sentiments across the, the continent and countries like South Africa really are suffering from this. What that means is that investors in Sub-Saharan Africa are starting to hold back. They're starting to adopt a wait and see attitude until those uncertainties really you know, dissipate. And that's not good for jobs. You know, it paints a really stark picture. And yes, we have the economies that are plowing ahead and giving us some hope. But it looks like it really is tough times for the continent. Right. We have a lot of policymakers in this room. We have a lot of private sector players, other stakeholders. What must African countries do now to try and make a difference? 
Julie, I think African countries can do four things. Mm -hmm. And the first is actually embracing, fully embracing trade. That may sound counterintuitive in a world where most of the countries are building walls and barriers. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, this is the time Africa has decided to embrace change and ratify the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And I think this is one of the most important achievements our continent has done. It's can a we, huge Can we give that a round? Are we excited by that? So, Julie, we need to embrace trade and regional trade between our countries. Why? Because, not, not because it's just a political feel good, but because it sounds economics. Mm -hmm. In fact, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, if implemented well, could become the biggest buffer from global uncertainty. Mm -hmm. We can mitigate the impact of trade tensions by trading more across borders. But for that to happen, we would need to address the issues of non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. We'll need to address issues of free movement of people across the continent. And we will have to work hard to get regional value chains to start operating. When I say regional value chains, let me just give you an example. Think about it. What is wrong with a company that would settle in Cote d'Ivoire to produce sneakers for the African population using rubber from Ghana, using cotton and shoelaces from Mali, using machinery made in Nigeria to sell on the whole African And, and market. marketed by Kenyan marathon runners. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That would, be, that would be regional value chains that would create jobs and prosperity for African people. That's clearly one thing Africa can do and already has started to do it. And I think we need to give credit to African leaders for making this happen. We, we Second, need to be bold about that. We need to be bold, we need to fully embrace it. Okay. Second thing we can do is to clearly invest in climate resilient infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, a city like Bera in Mozambique almost got destroyed entirely by Cyclone Ida if it wasn't for the investment they have done before. Damage was huge, but some of the infrastructure were saved by investment they have made before that were climate resilient. We need to do this, although it may not be very politically, you know, it may not reward politicians, but these are the hard choices to make. Right. And our policies also need to be very, very climate conscious because climate change is real and it's already affecting African economies. Mm -hmm. The third thing our countries should do, uh, uh, Julie, is to make sure we continue the relentless fight against corruption because this issue of the African, you know, the Africa's polls has come up clearly with a link between the slowing down in economic reform, especially on structural policies like debt, mm -hmm. and the slowing down in reforms in public sector and governance and growth. So if we are to sustain growth moving forward, we need to build stronger capacity to manage our debt because at a, at a time where I was, the structure of our debt is changing, at a time where we are facing different risk profile, we need to equip ourselves to manage those risks, to manage those debt, to avoid the, the fact, to avoid that you know, an increasing number of African countries gets into debt distress like it is the case now. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we find that almost 40% of African countries are either in debt distress or in high risk of debt distress. 40%? Yes, of our countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. That is serious. We need to tackle this issue frontly. Mm -hmm. So that is about debt management. We need to improve the efficiency of our administration and fighting corruption. Why? Because that does not allow investment to prosper mm -hmm. and therefore no jobs to be created in our countries. Right. And the last thing, Julie, mm -hmm. the fourth thing our countries need to do, mm -hmm. builds on what 
my boss Hafez Ghanem just said earlier. It's about closing the opportunity gap between the poor and the rest and between men and women. Okay. We need to make sure that we create the conditions for boys and girls to achieve their full potential. And luckily, Julie, mm -hmm. if I may end with that, luckily, the solutions to close the poverty gap mm -hmm. are similar to solutions to close the gender gap that Mr. Ghanem has elaborated earlier on. And this is about education, right. keeping our kids, especially our girls, longer in school, giving them access to labor market, mm -hmm. making sure they do work when they go to school, mm -hmm. making sure they have access to land, making sure they have access to financial, financial resources to start their businesses. Mm -hmm. And we need to address the issues of social norms. Right. And in all our countries, we should all commit to become, just like my boss, all feminist, so that African women and boys reach their full potential. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much, Albert. We're going to the panel session just as we do for the gentlemen um, in the room. You know, I, I, I'm a mother of five, one daughter, all the rest are sons. And, and we need to set the context that this is not about women versus men. It's not about competition. It's yeah. about complementarity. Right. That when we do better, you do better. So can I see all the men who are he for she in the room? Please, and I, I'm looking at our leaders over here. Can I, I see some hands? Hopefully by the end of the panel, there will be many more. And now I want to welcome our incredible panelists to come up and, and, and join us. Acha Leke, senior partner at McKinsey Africa. Let's give him a round of applause. Shiro Waitaka from Fun Kids in Kenya. Christabel Ngwashi, who is MD and founder, more than just an MD, Cameroon, and also country winner of Blog for Dev in Cameroon. Warm round of applause for her as well. Hafez, please do come up and join us up here on the stage as well. Thank you, and I have to say, you know, we are getting better and better as the years go by at being, uh, at getting gender parity on our stages. And even in terms of age, we're getting younger and younger on our panels, which is amazing. Um, Acha, let me bring you in first, uh, because I really just do want to get an understanding of the numbers. When we sit here talking about empowering women and transforming Africa, can you take us what you are seeing in terms of the private sector first and then public sector? Thank right. you. And thanks, thanks, Julie, and thanks, uh, Hafez and Albert and the whole team for, for this uh, discussion. I think it's actually a critical one. We tend to talk about growth and about numbers and GDP and all of that, but not often enough do we talk about you know, one of the critical issues we have, which is uh, gender parity, mm -hmm. right? And so just to give you some numbers, we are far away from where we need to be from a gender parity perspective. If you look at, on the, if you start on the private sector side, um, women, of course, account for 50% of population. They account for 40% of middle management. They account for about 22% at the executive committee level, but they only account for 5% of CEOs. That's roughly the numbers across the <laughs> continent. Uh, now, by the way, that's as good as it gets around the world, right? If you look at the US, women account for 5% of CEOs, which, you know, again, tells us we have a long way to go. But that's on the, uh, on, the, on the private sector number. So there's a lot of leakage along the way, and we can talk about, you know, what, what causes that. Um, the second, if you look at in the public sector, if you look at cabinet and parliament uh, together, women account for about 25%. So it's a bit better on the, on the public sector side. Uh, we've talked about uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and South Africa that are leading the way, uh, not just in gender balance, but also overall. But again, there we have a long way to go. And it, it will take us, by the way, 140 years to achieve gender parity. So that's where we start. That's the starting position. 140 years. At this okay. Rate. So if I was to ask you, uh, you know, what are the interventions that we can make at this point that would make a, a difference, that would really start to unravel the, the, the current uh, you know, uh, status quo? What would those interventions be? Well, I mean, the, there are a number. First, I think you have to step back and say, why should you do it, right? If you look at the, again, on the private sector, and we did some of this work, we do this globally, but we also did it for Africa, where you, you, you show, and it's very clearly, that companies with more women on boards and or on executive teams just perform better. They make more money, 
up to 20% more money uh, on the continent. And so we always say, look, if you, for companies, you should do it because it's the right thing to do. But if you don't do it because it's the right thing to do, you should do it because it's the profitable thing to do. Mm -hmm. right? So either way, it's important <laughs> to, uh, to achieve gender, to make gender uh, uh, diversity a priority. Now, not enough of doing it, right? And, and the, really the four things, that if, if I focus on the, on the private sector, one is it has to be a CEO and board priority, right? It can't be the HR manager trying to do it. It has to be at that level. And when we interview, interviewed many, many companies, and only one out of three told us that this was a priority for the CEO at uh, the CEO level, right? So that has to change. Um, the second is then uh, creating the right business case, right? It's easy to say you should do it because it's the right thing, but at the end of the day, you know, for shareholders, you need the business case, and it exists, right? So we, we've seen companies creating, this is a business case for why, uh, why we're doing it and why we need, we need to change things. Um, the third thing is then confronting some of the limiting attitudes that I know Hafez spoke about quite a bit, right? Unconscious biases, uh, uh, programs for women in the workplace, so those kinds of things, really putting in place such a plan. And the fourth is just tracking, right? We still, all these numbers are giving you, it took us a year to get these across, uh, across companies, but we need a lot more companies to track. Where are women, how, where's the leakage? Is it at the entry level, at the middle management level, at the exco level, and then what can you do about it, mm -hmm. right? So we're really putting in place, uh, you know, think of it as a transformation program, and really tracking it is, is quite important. Thank you so much. You know, Christopher, I want to come to you now, and you really are at the front lines in terms of all of this. You see the limitations in your work. Every Every day on the ground as a doctor in communities. Um, you know, I, I would like you to take us a little bit through your work, set the context for everybody in the room, but then tell us what are the key limitations for women that we need to unpack and address, please. Okay, thank you, Julie, for giving me the floor. Um, I'm happy that um, we're putting health part of, as part of this conversation because there exists a vicious circle between um, poor health disempowerment of women and um, poverty. If a woman is not healthy, of course she can work, she can get income, and maybe she can also afford um, quality health care. Mm -hmm. So it's important that if we want to talk about women empowerment, we should also be talking about health care. And the connection between um, health and women empowerment comes in three forms. Either by their contribution to the health workforce or to the health system, because it has been shown that women in leadership positions in healthcare actually help health systems to be responsive, um, resilient. Mm -hmm. And those are factors that are needed for strong health systems. In the second place, we have to talk about women's access to the specific health care needs. It's also important that we understand that what women need as um, their health care needs, it's what the, like what the rest of the world needs. If we're talking about universal health coverage, we can't keep away what women need, be it um, access to menstruation products, be it access to sexual and reproductive health, or access to antenatal service or perinatal, access to quality um, perinatal health care services. And in the third place, we're going to talk about women who have the ability to contribute or to influence the health components of the human capital index. Mm -hmm. When we talk about stunting as one of the main indicators of the human capital, we have to talk about women because women directly or are directly and sometimes solely involved in the um, nutrition of children. So if we want to talk about stunting, we can't keep women aside. So when we bring these three factors together on how we can connect healthcare and women empowerment, we see that we can't leave health out. So so, but there's still a problem. Why are we having this conversation? Because we are still not attaining the potential that we're supposed to have. So the first thing I've identified is, um, as one of the limitations is conflict. I work in the conflict zone and I can tell you firsthand that that is not something to have. Mm -hmm. I have seen women who come to the hospital, we use moss plant in the place of parts. You don't want to think about it. I've received a dead woman who put to bed in the bush and couldn't get to the hospital on time because of ghosted towns and insecurity. Of course, she bled to death and I received her dead in the hospital. So it's important that if we have to reach the point where we're saying that, okay, women have to be empowered, they have to be in good health to work, they have to be in good health to take care of the children, we have to make sure that we also take, make sure that the, there is also peace. We try to solve the problem. If we can't prevent conflicts from happening, we should make sure that once we see that, okay, this is going to be a conflict, we should make sure we have an early response to it and make sure that we solve it early enough. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I think, um, 
is limiting us from reaching there is um, on the involvement of men. When I scan through this room, I see more men than women. That means that when we want to get, that's in some communities, when you have to get to the women, you still have to go through the men. Because you still have men in leadership positions, you have men as policy makers, and of course, change in policy is one of the factors needed for this agenda to be achieved. So it means that one way or the other, we still need men at the forefront of it, supporting it. We need every man to be a he for she, not just some putting up their hands, um, shy, or something of that sort. <laughs> so we need that. Yeah. Every man should be a he for she so that this agenda can be achieved. So I would say that if we involve more men and try to take care of conflicts, we should be a good distance gone. Thank you. Amazing. You know, you remind me. Thank you. Let's give her just so so passionate and, and so understandable because of the incredible work you do. You remind me of uh, an African proverb. I'm, I'm going to have to just try and remember it. Um, it's something to, to the tune of a king forgets that he suckled on his mother's breast. Ooh. So for any of the men who didn't put up your hand for he for she, I want to take you back to the importance <laughs> of a woman in your life, um, you know, and the need for complementarity. Um, you know, Shiro, I come to you. You, you, you are are, um, you've been in the space of entrepreneurship, you know, on the field, battling it out, you know. So, and and I, I believe you are passionate about the role that the circular economy can play to change things. Take us through your story and connect that, please, to your passion for the circular economy. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everyone. Really? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Better. Um, so I, I founded a business called Fun Kids. Fun Kids is the first, shockingly, children's brand out of Africa. We're the fastest growing continent, largest number of children and youth, yet we've never had a brand for children from Africa. So to Julie's question about the circular economy, it's a term I only got to find out this year, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And this was occasioned by the ban in logging in Kenya. Um, because we've not been responsible with our forests. And the government has said enough, which is very good for us, because when a child does wrong, the parents need to say, stop. But what did that then do for my business? It meant my primary raw material, because we also make furniture, doesn't exist. This is a global problem, not just Kenya. When you talk about conflict, people fight also because of scarcity of resources. It's a reality. It's going to happen. Mm. So when we talk about the circular economy, what does that mean? We are taking waste, and I must say waste generated in the West, waste generated in offices, waste generated in homes. We then upcycle it, we convert it into another product, mm -hmm. and we can then for the first time ever be affordable. We've talked about trade. We're not able to trade as entrepreneurs in Africa because of the cost mm -hmm. of raw material, power when you have it, inputs when you have them, taxes, I don't know who sets them, <laughs> I, I don't know. We, to achieve Pan-African growth and trade, we also need it to be affordable. Mm -hmm. Nigeria, is anyone from Nigeria in the house? I would love to sell furniture to you. Your population is huge. <laughs> Ethiopia, next door to us. I don't need to export to Europe. Honestly, we can trade with each other. But somewhere, someone, male, decides it should be expensive. So suddenly the circular economy is making it possible. I'm now able for the first time since we started 10 years ago to grow because why? We can hire more people. We are hiring people to collect waste, to do the dirty job according to data. We're able to hire more people to come collect the waste that you gluttonously have. We take it to our factory, upcycle it, and I'm now able to provide dignified furniture for children in schools in Kenya. Why? They deserve it. Dear leaders in this room and those listening, if you don't give dignity, even from the classroom, forget it. We will never achieve the growth. Forget in a hundred years, in a thousand years. Mm. You must show dignity to children, boys and girls. 
teachers, I, my heart breaks for teachers in Africa. How are they supposed to produce leaders who are innovative, global thinking, and they don't even have books? Yeah. They don't even have walls or roofs. Yeah. What are we doing? The circular economy is a phrase coined in the West, but in Africa and in my life, it is something we must do if we're to grow, to scale, and have dignified businesses. Wow, wow, thank you. You know, you speak of one of the most important stakeholders on the continent, teachers. The, the, the world's best teacher this year is an African, Peter Tabichi, from uh, a remote area where it is incredibly, um, it is affected by climate change. The drought is there and he's working with his students to use natural products to solve their solutions in high school. So it is possible, it is possible. Um, I come back to you before I come, Albert and Hafez, to you for more comments from you, for comments from you. I would just like you, to each of us, uh, to, tell, to tell us what role can the World Bank play? From where you sit, from what you see, you've got Hafez here, you've got Albert here, many others. What would you advise them in the role that they can play to be an effective and efficient partner in transformation, Acha? Um, I mean, I, I think first creating the, um, uh, the platform for these conversations, I think advocacy is absolutely critical, so, so I think, and, and, and you're doing that already. Um, you know, funding some of these programs is absolutely critical. You know, we know that there's a big uh, a funding gap in our country, so the World Bank support in funding some of these programs. And actually pushing uh, through the, the, the leverage you have, governments to think about it, because it's sometimes easier for governments not to focus on it. The many, I've seen many ministers of, of finance here, the many priorities that they have, competing priorities. So in some cases, I think the bank can play a, a, a fundamental role in, 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 in pushing them a bit more mm -hmm. in focusing on, on some of these programs that affect disproportionately women, whether it's on the financial front, whether, whether it's on the entrepreneurship front. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and, and another, I, I think one other thing, I don't know whether the bank can play here, I always say, if we talked about um, uh, uh, changing attitudes and how we have three countries now that have uh, gender balanced cabinets. And I always say, you know, it's just one person's decision, mm -hmm. right? It's the, president, it's the president's decision, you know, how they want, who they want in the government. Right. And so I think a lot more advocacy for anybody who comes into power through the bank and many other players here to actually encourage whoever the next person comes into power. We have a number of elections coming up this year and next year on the continent to really push them uh, to, to create some of these gender balanced cabinets. Because I think that is role, that's a role modeling and it's signaling that then you know, has a very, very, very positive effect. Thank Those you. Some so. ideas. Thank you, Christopher. Um, when, if we want to talk about um, interventions, I think in the first place we have to ensure that interventions intersect between the need, skills, and. Um, sustainability mm -hmm. for whatever the bank wants to do for whatever interventions they have to ensure that whatever we're, if we're talking about um, education for women we're talking about skills for girls we should ensure that <clears throat> These skills are actually needed. The education they are having is actually needed, by the, be it locally or globally. And um, how sustainable can we make maybe their businesses? How sustainable can we make maybe the machinery they use for agriculture? Or how can we make their health systems more sustainable and all of that? So it's important that for whatever investments the bank is making for in the healthcare systems, they should also put women at the forefront of it. Okay. You can't do something for women without women. That will just be somewhat against them. So women need to be at the forefront of it. If you're talking about maternal and child um, mortality, mm -hmm. you talk about traditional bed attendants, you could have a possibility of um, saying, okay, this is a traditional bed attendant. I've actually had women who tell me, I would prefer to go to a traditional bed attendant than coming to you because I trust her. She's part of the community. She's like a mother to her, so she trusts that she can take care of her better. So if we want to, like, okay, that is already a resource we'd have. We can now focus on the quality. Mm. Maybe you have to do with training this traditional bed attendant to deliver quality healthcare services. Why not go ahead to train them on family planning services and also um, provide them with sterile materials that they can use to make their Healthcare that's the, the, the healthcare that they deliver better. Right. So as much as they refer to as traditional, they're doing a life-saving job so you can't let them out. Same as community health workers. 
you have over 60% of global community health workers are women, but yet they work for little or no pay. Mm -hmm. So it's time we actually invest in those group of people. We make their work like we're no longer investing in the quantity because we already have the human capital. We have over 54% of over 50% of the um, African population is female. So we already have the quantity. So it's time for us to invest in the quality of that human capital as with a focus on the healthcare. And so when we do all of that, I think we should be on the way ahead. No, excellent. Thank you so much. Our mm -hmm. community health workers, our birth attendants, and our mm -hmm. midwives, and many people yeah. will only have access to them for, for the near future. Yeah. So let's invest in training and equipping them to do the best the job best, yeah. they can possibly do. Thank you so much. Shiro, your advice. What can the World Bank do? <clears throat> it's almost 2020. Stop with collecting data. You have we need, it. We need data. No, we have, we we need need data. We have the data. We have no. the data. Women are disadvantaged, period. Girls <laughs> suffer, period. Inequality, period. Poor health. We can't do this again. We can't keep having this conversation. Stop it. Bring all our leaders in this room. Bring them into this room and do not let them out until they sign. Do not give them money. Do not fund us. We are naughty. We need to be like African parents. You are the parent. You listen, you child. Okay? Yeah. It's 2020. We can't keep funding because I don't, I don't understand this conversation. How are there no young people in this room? The future of Africa is young people. They're not here. They're not on this panel. Mm. It's an honor to be here, but why aren't we, they We have yeah. one young person. Yeah, but okay. they're younger. Okay. It was better than a two, few years two. ago, I promise. <laughs> if, if, if you ever receive a delegation, especially from my country that's all male, send them back. Yeah. Please. Please. That's a good one. We need to talk truth. Do not spend any more money on us until we step up and shape up. That's what I'm saying. Wow. <laughs> so, don't. so I, I bring it to Hafez and to Albert. And, and let me just say, data will always be important. I think the way we collect it may be less costly in the future because of just digital. It, yeah. However, the important thing is to bring the data to life. Use it. So then, use yes, it. yes. Use the data. Bring now. it to life. Enough. Um, uh, Hafez, don't give them money. No. If they don't give these they're grants and loans and support, if they're not doing the basic things that need to be done, can the World Bank put some conditionality some African parents around the gender issue? Uh, <laughs> 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 well, the, 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 uh, you, you have to see what the bank does. We don't really give money we finance projects mm. so do you want us to stop financing until we step up yeah schools which no. project do you want me to stop no. financing <laughs> schools hospitals no. hospitals no. agriculture Road, them, yeah. girls education uh, safety nets for the poorest just tell me which one i should stop financing <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, uh, uh, we sometimes show tough love in our discussions with, uh, with our counterparts. But, 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 but in the end, uh, you, uh, and we give advice, in the end, uh, I don't believe in the parent-child uh, analogy. Uh, I more believe in the advisor. Uh, and uh, partner analogy, yeah. where you need to give advice to our uh, 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 <coughs> to our governments, to our countries, uh, but we cannot. Uh, uh, we are funding projects to fight poverty, to help young girls, to help young boys, and uh, this is something that we need to continue doing. Mm -hmm. Regardless, even even if we don't agree with the government, I still want to help the people of the country. Thank you, thank you, Albert. Your thoughts? Well, um, on all the comments, yeah. So let me come in the defense of my sister. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I heard her saying is that there are a number of things we already know. Yeah. Yeah. And we should stop 
you know, digging and digging and trying to find 10 different explanations to the problem we yeah. know and for which we know the answer, yeah. mm. right? Yes. It took simply leadership from Rwanda, Ethiopia, and, uh, you know, it, it was the third country South that Africa. has done. Not South Africa. Africa. South Africa. Mm. It took just leadership yeah. to say we will have 50% women in cabinet. Yeah. Guess what? They found them. Yeah. And you know the countries, they, they'll be telling you, oh, we can't find good enough women yeah. to be ministers. Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there are things for which we know the answer. Yeah. Let's stop really turning around yeah. circles, the turning in circles. I think that's what I heard her yes, say. Yes, exactly. Now, there are other issues for which we don't have answers. Mm. And we do a lot of that at the World Bank as well, because we are not just a project and money bank. We are a knowledge bank as well. We do need some data to understand what actually works to get women ahead on the economic front. And some of that work is done in my office, all across the bank, all over the world as well. We may still need some data to advance that ag agenda. But f for all, you know, for, for all intent and purpose, we should stop kicking the can down the road when yeah. it comes to advancing yeah. women in our societies. We know what to do. Yeah. Now, let me say a second thing, which is when you look at our cabinets, often you have a token minister for women affairs uh -huh. or gender in cabinet. Uh -huh. And have we actually been asking, what voice does she have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Does she actually contribute to decisions that can make everybody's life change, and especially women? Yeah. Do they? No. In, you know, often, from my experience, they are relegated to, uh, you know, afterthought discussions because they're just Ministry of Gender or Ministry of Women Affairs and nobody actually know what women affairs are, right? So again, these are things we can fix. Why don't we have 50% of African finance minister women? By the way, they are more responsible. I have a two hand. <laughs> Because I, I don't agree that, I mean, I deal with many African governments. And sorry, the world has changed. Give me a break. Look at this room. Give me a break. There, we, don't, we have women in positions of power across, uh, across the continent. Okay, maybe Niger does not have 50% women in the cabinet, but we have uh, our governor f uh, from Niger uh, is a woman. Uh, uh, maybe Mali does not have 50% women, but, but we have our minister from Mali is here. Come on, come on, give me a break. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Can, but can I, but there is more. There is look, more look to at be the done. executive directors representing Africa from the uh, uh, at the World Bank's uh -huh. board, right? We have uh, we, we have two women. Half uh, so half of the executive directors representing Africa at the board are women, and they are very strong and and have a very loud and uh, voices. And strong voice. Voices. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, so, so, so thank come you. on, Albert. thank you. Come in, Archie. So I was going to say, can, you know, we can do we can do better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, let, let, let me come between the World Bank yes. uh, <laughs> colleagues here. Because I, I, think, I, I think both are right. I think affairs, we have made progress. It's very clear if we look at the numbers five, ten years ago, we've made progress. Yes. But we are far from where we need to be. Yeah. Right? So to Albert's point, the reality is, even in the private sector, of those roles, I said 56% of women in leadership are in what we call staff roles, not in line roles. Mm -hmm. Right? Typically, CEOs come from line roles. Mm -hmm. Right? So back to, same in the public sector, right? More of the women there, we saw the 25%. But more of them are in staff type positions versus line positions. So that's part of what needs to happen. We need to get more women into more line roles because that is what typically leads to uh, uh, the top job. That's one. Second, back to Shiro, you know, you know, uh, maybe because I'm because we need data. Right? 
I, I, I agree, by the way, that you know the things that we know we should get to. So execution is an issue. We need yeah. to get stuff executed yeah. versus coming and talking yeah, about right. it. <laughs> but we need to be able to track it, right? Part of the issue we have on the women's front is just like you know, as a company, you want to do a big transformation. You launch the projects, the initiatives. You'll sit down every every week and track it. That's what has to be to be done, right? You know, I, I ran global recruiting for McKinsey for two years. Seven years ago, we had 24% of our intake being women. Mm -hmm. Today, we're at 45%. Wow. And it didn't happen, well, thanks for the time, but it didn't happen because we said it's the right thing. It's because there was data, there was tracking, people were responsible, there were targets. We looked at it every month and figured out, you know, also across the value chain, is it that we don't have enough women applying? Is it that they don't make it to the first round, the second round? And the interventions are very, very different. So I do think we need this data to help inform better decisions right. so that we can execute even better. So deliberate, intentional change mm -hmm. brought and informed by the evidence. Um, so let me come. We have uh, we have some public service leaders with us in the room, and I want to start there. I think as I go to the floor for questions, I'll also be getting some from um, social media. Um, so maybe if I could see any public service, uh, anybody in government who wants to share a perspective. I, 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 I may call on you if nobody puts a hand up. Do I see a hand? <laughs> Do I see any hands? Yes, no? Yes, here. Here, please, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then I'm coming to the floor. Please go ahead. He's not ready. He's not ready. Bring the mic to the front. Yes, thank you so much. Our sister from Niger, please. Yes, and thank you. Nous allons. Thank you very much. Okay. Are, is everybody ready? Great. Well, allow me to complete uh, what uh, Pres Vice President Hafez says. There is um, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda, etc. There are many women ministers. Guinea, my dear Mrs. Kani, there are women ministers of finance, ministers of development. So there are many women that are in strategic position in uh, uh, Africa's government. Don't, so the problem is not there. The issue is a matter of leadership. In order to carry out the change mentioned by Afez earlier, he said change is possible, change is happening. Yes, change is possible, provided that we have a solid leadership. Leadership is what? It is the leadership at the top of the state, just like at the lowest levels of the pyramid. This is how change can happen. I'm taking the example uh, of my country, Niger. Our current president, during his electoral campaign in 2011, stated, we cannot go far if we have to walk only on one foot. And when he said that, he said we have two legs. One is women, one is men, and we need both. We won't go far if we don't use both our feet, both our legs. We have to take women, women's into account. And this is why we've been progressing since 2011 in terms of uh, quota of women elected, uh, uh, quota in terms of um, decision uh, position yesterday. I wasn't here, but uh, it must have been a fascinating uh, Council of Ministers. Uh, it adopted a draft law to bring the quota even higher, move from 15% to elected positions to 25%, move from 55, from 25% to 30% in the decision-making positions. When a political will is there, things change, and we need a solid leadership so that the lines move. Under this current president, we have adopted a law that states that girls need to be in school and stay in school so that we do not have the kind of problems mentioned by Vice President Hafiz. We must have them stay in school so they don't get married at 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age. So lines will move if we have a good leadership at the top of the government and the state all the way down. Even the heads of villages have something to say. Thank you. For that, thank you. Would you just introduce yourself to everybody and wave so everybody knows? Um. 
<laughs> Thank you. I am Ashatou Blamakane, Minister by Conviction. <laughs> Since birth, I've been a feminist. Thank you. Please, uh, just put your hands up and we'll come to you. Let me know. Okay. There's one hand there and then we'll come around this way. As quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Anna Adeke. I'm a member of parliament from Uganda. Ah, uh, youth member of parliament. I'm 28 years old. To thank the panel for this elaborate discussion on empowering women mm -hmm. and uh, specifically to the point about including women in decision making processes. I think that it's not just about having women in influential positions, but it's having the goodwill and enabling their capacity yep. to make influential yes. decisions mm. because many times. It's, it's become a, a cake for world leaders to lead all men panels, yeah. to have all men cabinets. Yeah. But now they're just adding women as icing on the cake. Yeah. It's not that. It's that women are a very important ingredient of the cake. Thank you. So it's not just about having women yeah. in these positions. Yes. It's about having women and enabling them to be influential Thank and make you. important critical yeah. decisions. Yeah. That is when the equality, that's when the parity will make meaning to many of us. Thank you. Because now we're just having figures that are deceitful. They are not True. transforming yeah. the lives of women. Before I leave you, do you feel empowered in your role? Yeah. Do you feel empowered in your role? Very much, okay. very much. As a young woman, because I struggled as a woman, but even worse, as a young woman. I got to parliament when I was 24 years old. Oh, wow. But the Ugandan system has made it possible for young people to, to be in leadership thank positions you. like thank mine. You, thank you. Big round of applause for her. Let's see hands over here. Gentlemen, uh, gentlemen over there in the glasses, please. And then the lady, uh, two rows in front. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Melvin Foote. I'm the president of the Constituency for Africa, former consultant to the World Bank Africa region. Uh, I app applaud the panel. I think it's outstanding. But it seemed to me that uh, there's more emphasis on the political as opposed to the economic. And it seemed to me, in my country, we have a saying, um, finance without, uh, romance without finance is nonsense. And uh, so I'd like to know what your what should be the priority? Should it be financial or should it be political? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. Lady just in front, uh, just two rows in front with the glasses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pisuwasa. I'm from Rwanda. Mm -hmm. I want to first of all agree with the, the lady that spoke before, uh, that leadership is paramount. But I think the other thing that we have to talk about is um, I think somebody talked about the leakage along the way. Mm -hmm. I think that's a conversation that we have to, to, to have. I will give an example. Mm -hmm. I work for the Central Bank in Rwanda mm -hmm. in a senior leadership role. I recently went through a recruitment process, had a very good turn up of uh, women mm -hmm. uh, applying and getting into the job. Mm -hmm. But once they get into the job, and unfortunately these are tough conversations that we have to have or realities Let's that we have, have to have. Yeah. So you have uh, these two people, a lady and a, and, and a young man. The lady gets married, starts to have children, mm. and I immediately start to hurt for her because I see her being pulled back by that because we've developed this career path that says, you know, for you to advance from one level to the other, you have to have this level of education. But she's going to hold back on her education because now she's going to focus on, 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 on family while the gentleman is, 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 is progressing. So I think that point the taken. Ta tackling the, the leakage uh, is, is, a, is a critical uh, point taken. But can I say to everybody in this room, a woman having children is not a medical condition or problem yeah, that or holds you back. Um, it is how a, a, an institution deals with those issues to empower her to work in a more flexible way. And my career grew fastest when I had my five children over nine years. Nine years. And it grew faster. So I, I want to encourage us not to think of it as limiting women, but just how do we support them to serve and to do the job even while they're having children. Um, thank you so much. Uh, gentlemen over there, and then I'll come to the lady at the front here. Thank you. 
the gentleman with his hand up. Thank you. And then I'll come back to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to raise an issue mm -hmm. that I think is in line with the, the it's, I mean, uh, uh, demographic growth. Mm -hmm. We all know that it's uh, also a major challenge. It's good, the, the demographic growth, but uh, sometimes the state cannot catch, provide education to everybody, and uh, too much people might mean depleting the, 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 the natural resources. Now, the relation, uh, Africa, uh, sorry, World Bank is in the position to make analytical research into the relation between women empowerment and uh, demographic growth. Thank you for that. Could you introduce yourself, please? I am an Italian diplomat. My name is Filippo Scamacca. Thank and you. And I have been uh, uh, serving in Africa for a long time. Uh, Thank and you. I think that this might be an issue that has a certain weight. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Final question, lady right here at the front in the blue. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Lynette Karenyi. I'm a member of parliament from Zimbabwe. And I'm also a deputy president from my party, the biggest political opposition party in Zimbabwe. Excellent. Thank you very much. I was much touched with the issue of Kenya, whereby you are helping the young kids in school. And I was just reflecting to say, we are also experiencing the issue of teachers. If you check in our continent, the issue of Africa, the salaries of teachers mm. are not even uh, 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 pleasing. And I think uh, as World Bank and other uh, partners, I think let's focus more on those teachers because for the, a girl child to have quality education, the teacher must be also be remunerated. The, all, the issue is also about the issue of uh, dropouts from school. In Africa, especially in Zimbabwe with the economic challenges, it's not easy for a girl child to buy sanitary pad. I, saw, I, I, I was very, very touched with uh, the vice president when he was talking about how do we do in terms of promoting the girl child. I think we must now focus also on that side because if she doesn't attend school because of the uh, sanitary pet, it yeah. clearly shows that we are not even going somewhere there. Thank the you. other issue is about the issue of mentorship. Mm -hmm. I think uh, as we are growing up, we are going uh, to our issues of elderly and maybe retirement. Let's have now the issue of mentorship. How are we going to mentor our young women so that our continent will continue to have this kind of women who are always standing up for the rights of a girl child? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think this connects to, thank you, one of the comments that was made um, uh, online. Um, De von Dweng says, women's voice need to be heard. She says, uh, can you help me understand why condoms are free and pads are sold? Sex is a choice, but menstruation is not. Yep. I strongly advocate for menstrual and sexual hygiene equally. Thank you. Um, excellent comment that, was, uh, that came in online. So let's go to um, the last issues raised around our teachers. And I think this is an important agenda. Um, maybe, Hafez, I'll start with you on this one. How do we do better with you know, ensuring teachers are well-trained and well-remunerated? Well, uh, I, I think it's, it's a very important point that uh, we need to uh, look at the quality of the teachers. Mm -hmm. and today, uh, we also need to add something else in the equation. Look at how we can use technology mm -hmm. to help our teachers mm -hmm. and to improve the quality of education. Uh, in, uh, in many schools now, increasingly, they're using technology, iPads, uh, uh, to to bring in le lessons uh, for uh, to, to the students, mm -hmm. and actually, uh, many of our analysts have shown that if if you b by doing this, so you have very very experienced teachers uh, on video mm -hmm. presenting lessons to the students, and it's interactive, mm -hmm. and, and they have a teacher in the classroom whose role now changes, it becomes like a coach. She becomes like the coach as well. And what we have found is that it's not only improves the quality of learning for the children, it also 
helps the teacher. The teacher learns mm -hmm. from, from this process. So uh, increasingly, I mean, I would like to, us to start thinking of, about how we can use uh, innovation and technology to, uh, to uh, uh, leapfrog right. some of those issues. Because if you want to retrain the, the teachers in the country, it will take years. Right. And we, we, don't, ha we don't have so years. So use technology. We don't have years. We need to move fast. OK, thank you. Uh, Albert, I want to come to you with a question. It seems that there's more emphasis in this discussion on political rather than economic. And, and, and your thoughts on, on the roles that each of these, these will play the way forward. Look, uh, thank you so much, Julie, and thanks for that question. I think both are important. Mm -hmm. Madam Kani has insisted so much on the role of leadership. That's politics, right? But at the same time, uh, we need to back those commitments with financing. And that's what we are working to do at the World Bank. We are funding a number of uh, projects to really empower women across uh, Africa. And one thing I, I would like to highlight here is that the new regional strategy for the Africa region has actually placed women empowerment as the key entry point for improving human capital outcomes. Mm -hmm. Just like we have heard through this discussion and Mr. Ghanem's speech, Women empowerment connects to all the human capital outcomes, be it nutrition, be it uh, education, be it uh, you know, uh, agency, be it uh, uh, you know, uh, access to resources, access to capital. Mm -hmm. All those are important. And at the World Bank, we're actually funding projects in each of these areas to make sure we, we make a difference. So both are important. Let me come to you, Shiro, on the question of uh, women in positions and needing their voices to be empowered. Is that someone we need? Is that something that we actively need people to do for us? Or when women come into those positions, no matter how much the structures try to hold you down, what responsibility do we have as women to really take hold of the mandate and run with it in spite maybe of some of the people around us? Thank you, Julie. Um, on a now even more serious note, especially as an entrepreneur, when I look at our leaders, mm -hmm. I don't know where the Kenyans are today. Fact, okay? This is a very important conversation, and I applaud the, wor the work the World Bank is doing. But if they're not even here to listen to us when we're here, they don't listen to us when we're at home. We are in the room. The World Bank has now redesigned the table to allow more women Mm -hmm. to sit at the table. Uganda, Rwanda is redesigning this. Women are taking their mantle. Mm -hmm. But for as long as we are still used as tokens to the young ladies, I am exhausted being used as a marker pen to tick a box. Women tick, young tick. It now needs to be intentional. We are able not because we're women, but because we are good leaders. Mm -hmm. We are able, not because we birthed all of you, but because we care about the world. It shouldn't be, it is complex. We need the data for sure. But all I was saying is we have so much of it and we must continue checking. Mm -hmm. But in a year's time, I wanna see when this event happens again, actual, tangible, intentional results Okay. for women, by women, and with men. Right. We need each other. Okay. But for as long as you keep seeing us as a different species from a different planet that you then use to tick the box and do your reporting, we will never change. Good people, Thank let's you. just be intentional. Continue with the data, but use the one you already have. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Let me come. Let me come to you, Acha. And there was the question of demographics and the impact that that has uh, very quickly. And then I'll get a final word from Christabel. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, on the demographics, I think I think throughout this conversation, we've we touched on a lot of the limiting factors that we identified, right? One of which is demographics. One of which is unconscious bias. That's absolutely critical. That 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 people mention uh, mentorship. But what's more important for us is sponsorship, actually, right? So a mentor provides guidance and advice. A sponsor creates a 
opportunities for you. Um, uh, the un unhelpful workplaces, we heard about, you know, what happens in some places. The work. So, but, but the reality is, uh, that's what you, the interventions, are, we know what the interventions are. Uh, maybe this is where the bank could help in terms of creating this long list. It's all micro interventions. There's not one big thing that's going to just solve the problem. But we know these interventions. And I think what's more important is for us to actually start tracking the impact. Right? I don't know if it's a doing business type, mm. HED type index, and we can then track countries and how they're progressing on a regular basis. So we know that we're actually making, making progress. I think that will be more important than, you know, this is a great conversation, but if, to avoid having this conversation every year, mm -hmm. yeah. it's really tracking where we are and then figuring out how we, how we, how thank we move you, forward. Thank, thank you, Archa. Final word, Cristobal, share your thoughts with us as we close the panel. Okay, thank you. Um, as much as everyone here or policymakers are trying to make women more involved or trying to get women more involved in leadership leadership positions or influential decisions, we as women don't have to feel like it's some sort of an entitlement because whatever we do, we have to be qualified to get to those positions. So it's time we stop making excuses, we stop taking it like, okay, since it's all about women empowerment, by virtue of the fact that I'm a woman, I'm supposed to be in parliament, I'm supposed to be 50%. So we have to also take the step to ensure that we are qualified to actually be in those positions. And then in the second place, I would say that whatever we're doing, we need to make sure that it starts right from the grassroots, just like the minister was saying. Thank you. Communities have to be part of this. You need to involve communities. It's not just up there at um, the level of policies or everything. As much as the policies are made up there, we need to ensure that it gets to the bottom of the pyramid and ensure that communities are also part of those decision-making processes. Right, and ultimately it begins in our homes. Thank you so much. We couldn't have ended on a better note. Thank you. But before we close, Hafez. Um, blog for Dev, I believe you have an announcement for the competition for this coming year. Uh, yes, uh, the blog for Dev topic this year will be what will it take to end child marriage in your country? Wow. So any African between the ages of 18 and 28, so you are not uh, <laughs> uh, you are not included, Albert, uh, 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 can enter uh, the, uh, into this competition. How, what will it take to end child marriage in your country? And there are lots of very good prizes. Yeah. Now, if you want to know more about it, I suggest that you go to the website, uh, Blog for Dev, uh, B L O G, the number four, D E V. And it is, uh, the, uh, apparently, the website just went live now. Oh, well done. The website is live. I, I love to tell people Blog for Dev was birthed by myself and Diara uh, Dia too, uh, who many of you will know. I don't know if she's with us uh, this she's morning. She's here somewhere. Yeah, so thank you. There she is. Thank you, Diara too. And that's what happens when women sit together and work together and power forward. We create things for our younger ones. We, we think maternally. But I want to end with uh, a quote I just picked up uh, uh, from, from, from uh, I think, your leader in, in Niger. You said, we cannot go far if we have to walk on only one foot. So let's put our men and our women forward together collectively. Thank you so much for joining us and a big round of applause to our panel. Thank you.